President of Romania, His Excellency Klaus Werner Johannes. Dear colleagues, dear colleagues, we have the President of Romania, Klaus Johannes, with us uh, today. Dear President, dear Klaus, welcome to the European Parliament. Thank you for accepting our invitation to address this House as part of our This is Europe series of debates. Seventeen years of European Union membership have been transformative for Romania and for Europe. It has given new impetus for businesses, for industry, for science and academia. It has brought reforms and social benefits. It has brought opportunities for people and levelled up communities. EU membership has meant protection for people's rights, for social justice and the rule of law. And in times of geopolitical change, these European values must be defended. Dear President, I would like to particularly thank you for your country's unwavering support for Ukraine and for the Republic of Moldova, particularly now that EU accession negotiations have begun. Thank you to Romania for always being the champion the people of those nations needed. Romania has a, a special place uh, in my heart. It is a country that has embraced what it means to be European. At the height of the pandemic, Romanian doctors flew to hospitals in other member states to help. When we faced devastating natural disasters, Romanian firefighters left their country to run into the flames. In the first days of the brutal Russian invasion of Ukraine, Romanian families rushed to the border to comfort those fleeing. So, mulțumesc pentru tot, Romania. Mr. President, yours is a country that has shown how to overcome challenges and how to lead. Europe is stronger thanks to Romania, thanks to your reinforcement of the EU's eastern flank. And we will be stronger still when you finally take your rightful place in the Schengen area and join the Eurozone in the future. And you will find this House on your side on that journey. Last word, on the 9th of June, over 19 million Romanians will be called upon to choose the 33 members uh, of the European Parliament elected to represent them. We must work together to make sure people understand why they must vote, why it is important. Their voice matters for the European Union and Romania's future. And we must keep listening and keep delivering. Dear President, dear Klaus, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Madam President of the European Parliament, distinguished members of the European Parliament, ladies and gentlemen, it is an honour for me to be here today before you. Thank you, President Metzola, for giving me the opportunity to come back to the heart of European democracy at the beginning of a crucial year for the future of the European Union. Like five years ago, when I spoke before the European Parliament, I'd like to reassert the confidence that me and the Romanian people have in the value of the joint and solidary European action in the undeniable power of one Europe. The effects of the pandemic, the Russian war of aggression against Ukraine, the conflict in the Middle East, these are but a few of the dramatic developments which, in recent years, have put to the test not just our response capabilities, but also our sincere attachment to the Union and to the 
values and the principles that hold us together. Ladies and gentlemen, my country is probably one of the best examples of EU's power to bring about change. Accession has brought us undeniable and most concrete benefits. European funds received by Romania since the moment of accession have allowed us to carry out essential infrastructure projects. More than 600,000 young Roma Romanian young men and women have participated in the Erasmus program, thus embracing the European way of life. The Union is a space of safety, protection, prosperity and diversity. Par excellence, the European Union is an area of free movement. The elimination in March of air and maritime border checks must be naturally and quickly followed by the elimination of land border checks. Only in this manner will we able to have an accurate and concrete reflection of the, of the contribution that Romania brings to strengthening the security of the entire European Union. Ladies and gentlemen, the European project needs every day attention, effort, patience and honesty if we want to live free in a united and prosperous Europe. Today, Romania is a strong promoter of coordinated joint action in the spirit of European values. It is our responsibility to support a Europe that takes forward these principles and values, also in regard to our friends in the European neighbourhood who have chosen our model of democracy, our model of development. And the key moment of this process is represented by the very European elections. The priorities that we shall define together in the aftermath of these elections will come to help us to provide a pragmatic response to the challenges of the present and better prepare us for the challenges of the future. And our union faces unprecedented geostrategic challenges. Our future and the future of the next generations depend on each and every decision we are taking now. On a global level, the rules-based international order is being challenged over and over again. Russia pursues its aggression against Ukraine. Around the Union, instability and insecurity have reached alarming levels. The open conflict in the Middle East, the situation in the Red Sea, and the worry, worrying developments in the Sahel, all these have a systemic impact on our own security. Climate change, economic difficulties, and illegal migration continue to generate their own negative impact, adding to the complexity of global dynamics. On top of all these challenges, we witness a crisis of values. And as far as I see it, a crisis of public trust in our institutions. We are indeed facing an erosion of values within the European Union, which fuels the perception of decline of Europe, or at least of Europe's leadership and global role. This is why we need to do more to promote the feeling and the certainty that we are all part of the same community of values, which must be protected by every single one of us.
Honourable members of the European Parliament, at such a pivotal moment, fundamental questions lie ahead of us. We must answer them together as Europeans with vision, courage and responsibility. First, what can we do and have to do as a union? The current challenges are pushing us towards a transformative rethinking of our actions. The past few years proved that our common action as one, as a true union, is key. Our unity has been repeatedly tested and has not faltered. More than this, it was a strategic surprise for some and brought us tactical advantages. We should build upon this. Second, thinking further, another, another crucial question emerges. What can we do more internally? Strengthening our internal resilience is a fundamental condition for a stronger union and for its increased geopolitical role. It is perhaps the most complex discussion. It includes finding the best strategies to respond to hybrid threats and to increase the functionality of our democratic systems. It means developing sectoral policies, such as technology, including artificial intelligence, fight, fighting climate change, stimulating competitiveness through industrial production and sustainable supply chains. I do believe that the success of the demarches in these areas depends on a strong single market, which can provide solutions to many of the problems we face, encouraging creativity and large-scale development. We, as a union, are now taking unprecedented steps to move away from a reactive approach in consolidating our internal resilience. We are taking action in terms of strengthening our internal capabilities, such as infrastructure, green and digital transitions, civil crisis response, energy efficiency, and supply chains. Another obvious line of action is to continue to support Ukraine. We must stand by Ukraine and its people. I have this conviction, despite certain voices invoking a European solidarity fatigue. Defending democracy, territorial integrity and sovereignty, as well as the rules-based international order, cannot be subject to any fatigue. <clears throat> Romania remains engaged in this common effort. We are strongly involved in supporting Ukraine, as well as the Republic of Moldova, which is intensely affected by the crisis in the region. We also need to keep our focus on security. We are now moving towards a joint, long-term planning and increased convergence in the field of European security and defense while working in full complementarity with NATO. It is indeed high time to deliver on our European ambitions when it comes to our defense industry. Esteemed members of the European Parliament, I wish to express my appreciation for the strong attachment to values that this House has always shown. But we must be aware about the growing Euro skepticism. Its adepts may raise issues that are in some part real, but they give wrong and dangerous solutions that would throw 
our societies into crisis. It is therefore our common duty to be honest in our communication with the European citizens. Third, how can the Union further externalize its attractiveness? This is another key question to address when looking towards our future. How can we stay attractive as a union? The answer is clear. Enlarging our European family by accepting new members will only strengthen the union. The historic decisions taken by the European Council last December on the Republic of Moldova and Ukraine, as well as on Bosnia and Herzegovina and on Georgia, are a victory for the entire European Union. This Parliament has been strongly supportive of this objective, and I thank you for this. <clears throat> Romania and I personally have strongly supported and promoted it. I think that it confirms the Union's attractiveness at the time of hardship, strengthens its geopolitical weight and creates opportunities for member states and candidate countries alike. Enlargement is an essential part of our strategic answer to the geopolitical developments and a key investment in lasting peace, stability and democracy in our neighborhood. At the same time, the European Union must assume a leading global role in preserving the international order as a precondition for preserving our way of life and our values. The European Union's economic weight must be mirrored by its international political role. The challenges we are facing are global and some of them can only be solved by promoting relationships with partners with similar values and interests. Ensuring this strategic network of resilient partnerships will make us stronger and more competitive in the long run. This is why we need to intensify our global outreach towards Africa, Asia Pacific and Latin America. And we do need to further consolidate the transatlantic link. This is crucial for our success. Two last questions. Do we have the means to achieve our goals? And which is the way forward? And what is the future of the Union? The Union has the legal and institutional instruments to achieve its goals and the response to the pandemic and the crisis that followed is illustrative. But it is equally obvious that we need to streamline our decision-making capacity. We need to closely analyze what measures can be taken in a context where some consider that the real efficiency of decision-making mechanisms is impossible without reopening the treaties, while others radically rule out this possibility. There is no doubt that measures such as those discussed in relation to the qualified majority voting in specific areas of foreign and security policy can be taken without reopening the treaties, without excluding changes to the treaties at some point, we need to use 
all available possibilities under the existing treaties for smoother and quicker decision making. Romania is fully engaged in this exercise. <clears throat> Honorable members of the European Parliament, despite the views of some, we are stronger now than five years ago. We showed remarkable unity in probably the direst circumstances we had to face as a union. Nevertheless, we have a lot of work ahead of us. Our European con common construction is, after all, work in progress. As stated by Jacques Delors, the visionary European leader that, whom we recently paid homage to, I cite, the European model is in danger if we obliterate the principle of personal responsibility. I close the quote. Therefore, dear colleagues, it is our shared responsibility to do the best for all our citizens. We have a special responsibility towards our youth. The future generations are looking towards us with hope and optimism in times of geopolitical volatility and socio-economic distress. The future of Europe is about the capacity of the Union to give them honest answers and to deliver in education, health, prosperity, climate security and employment opportunities. Five years ago, we adopted the Sibiu Declaration. The ten commitments made back then are still valid. Unity, solidarity, cohesion, the rule of law, they continue to lie at the very core of our joint European action. For my part, I remain deeply faithful to these valuable values and principles in my future endeavors. And I'm convinced that these are the basis for the work done by you here in the European Parliament as well. I also believe that together we are able to maintain the Union on the path of success staying true to our vision of a united and stronger Europe. Thank you. much, President. As you can see, the colleagues have very much appreciated um, your speaking points and your speech. I start by now by giving the floor to President of the EPP Group, Manfred Weber. Madam President, Commissioner, Mr. President, Good to have you in the European Parliament. Welcome. And I want to start with a quote. We cannot ignore the challenges we face on the eastern flank. Security and defense are fundamental components of Union's future. These, Mr. President, are words uh, from you. In the Munich Security Conference in 2019, I was in the audience and you were right then and you are right now. The war in Ukraine has been a wake-up call for many but not for you. When you entered in office in 2014, you said the defense was one of the priorities for Romania and for Europe. In 2017, you managed to get the Romanian parliament to increase defense spending 
to meet the NATO 2% commitment. And in 2023, Romania committed to spend for defense 2.5% of its GDP. It's your determination that made Romania a strong pillar of European defense and one of Ukraine's greatest allies. This is leadership at its best, not speaking about problems, but solving them. And, dear President, when we look at Romania today, we see a true European success story. Since joining the European Union in 2007, Romania has become a active country. Bucharest is number one in the Balkans for building up startups. Cluj is a true European tech hub, a country full of talents that is fighting to turn brain drain in brain gain. Dear Mr. President, great leaders are not only great at national level, but they are also great on European level. And you, you also remember, remembered us uh, that in the CBU summit in 2019, the first EU summit to be held on a Europe's day, you got all leaders to agree on a Europe that protects its citizens. You have advanced many EU defense initiatives, always working for a strong EU pillar in a strong NATO. You started many strategic discussions on enlargement, and it was also your strong voice in the European Council that made it possible to open the accession talks with Ukraine and Moldova last December. Europe owes a lot to Romanian leadership, and Romania owes a lot to your leadership. You showed to Romanian citizens that a modern, a pro-European Romania is possible and is successful. And I want to also thank the Romanian Commissioner, Adina Valian, and all Romanian colleagues in the plenary who served also to this broader perspective. And, dear President, for us as EPP, there is also no doubt that it's now also time that Romania must fully join the Schengen area. You have been ready for 13 years on this subject. If planes, dear friends, and ships are crossing borders without inspection, why should cars and trucks have to wait in endless lines? Romania and Bulgaria must mean Schengen. It's good for the security, it's good for the business, and it's good for our citizens. In the middle of the Brexit crisis in 2019, the spirit of CBU was fresh air to relaunch Europe. Now, five years later, if I may say this from an EPP point of view, the EPP family will go to Bucharest for the Congress, will go to Romania to kick off our campaign and to kick off the campaign for the European elections. And once again, Romania is the place to shape a safer home for all Europeans. Thanks for your leadership. Thank you, Mr. Weber. Now, on behalf of the S&D group, Juan Fernando Lopez Aguirre. Gracias, Presidenta. Thank you, uh, President Metzola. President Johannes, having listened to what you've said, I'd just like to share two very positive messages that you gave to us. First of all, I'm quite sure that you know just how many of us in the European Parliament very much celebrate that for the first time under the Spanish presidency at the end of December, we've been able to lift the restrictions uh, for your full enjoyment of the Schengen area uh, or for Romania and Bulgaria or for both air borders and maritime borders. This was a, a historic resolution. We know that the whole process uh, started in 2011 when the Commission decided that both, process, uh, both Romania and Bulgaria had overcome the various uh, requirements. So, so we're very happy that you are now able to enjoy the uh, Schengen area. We know that when it comes to European solidarity, um, especially in the area of displaced persons from, as a result of Russian ag aggression in Ukraine, uh, we know that there are uh, thousands, hundreds of thousands of vulnerable women and children that have come into Europe across the border with Romania. 200,000 are still in Romania being able to enjoy these temporary protection uh, orders. Uh, they're able to uh, live freely and work and be educated and uh, obviously the rights to education and to health cover 
So I'd like to express my recognition to the solidarity, this very uh, positive solidarity. And then only yesterday, the European Parliament validated 1.5 uh, billion euro for the uh, Solidarity Fund, for the 1.5 billion euro to support immigration, which obviously is a strengthening and uh, the enhancing of the rights of those people who have entered the European Union looking for protection. Thank you. The next speaker is the President of the Renew Group, Valérie Ayer. Thank you, President. Mr. President, Commissioner, dear colleagues, Romania is starting an electoral cycle. The presidential, local, as well as the EP elections, these are going to be crucial elections, and it is a strong signal for the building of the future of Romania in Europe and domestically in just a few months. We know that Romania is fully rooted in the EU in fighting corruption. We have had a resolute uh, commitment to the European Public Proc uh, Prosecutor's Office, and that has been enormous in what has taken place in Bucharest. These values are the very basis of our European community. Our family, Renew will fight to the end for these uh, projects to make sure that they are brought to fruition. Now, we have an era in interference in our territories, and we're going to have to be robust in our response. Cyber protection, fighting disinformation are huge challenges. We know that the hard right is trying to sow hate in Romania and elsewhere. Therefore, we will have a big challenge to protect democracy and our institutions, Mr. President. Now, we have a community of destiny, and I am so pleased, therefore, to see the lifting of the air and sea borders and, uh, in Romania and Bulgaria next month. And before this chamber, I would like to state that our political group will continue to defend to the lifting the land border checks as well. That is a priority for us. So our community of destiny is a strong commitment also to the people in Ukraine. Their struggle is ours. And what they are doing is our fight too. And Romania has been supporting Ukraine full on. The security of our continent is under threat and it is together that we must act. I should like also to turn to Moldova for a second. I am so pleased that we have seen that the country is strengthening its path toward our union. Mr. President, this is a huge year, not just for Romania, but for all of Europe in this election cycle. Our institutions are at stake. It is our responsibility of all to protect them. On behalf of the Green Group, Nikolai Stefanica. President, Minister, Commissioner, Madam President, we speak today about the future of Europe and the future of Romania, and we all wish for peace, freedom, equality. But today's reality is different. So many Romanians continue to leave the country. We need new hospitals. Our population is poor. Millions of young people don't know what to expect from the future. In order for populism and extremism not to grow, as you have said, democracy must go hand in hand with wealth. Romanians and Bulgarians are still queuing at the borders. They want to become part of the Schengen area in a dignified manner this year. President, I want to thank you for your engagement towards Ukraine and for your Euro-Atlantic um, position. This is the right way. But your mandate and also our mandates are coming to an end. So let us ask, what kind of Romania do we leave behind? What Europe do we leave to our young people? What did we want to do in Sibiu? This is also my city. Let's put the future of young people in the, in the center of our politics. They need to be listened to. They need to be heard. They need help. I want us to fight for a Romania which gives young people accessible, affordable housing, good jobs, um, good services. We need housing for students, our future doctors, professors, architects. Are, they live in poor housing conditions while they are studying. The future president of Romania, president, 
maybe is in one such student dorm today. How do we treat them? What do we offer to them? Let us also take care of our environment. I know you care for the environment. I also care a lot, such as the whole family of Greens. We need a greener Romania with clean cities, with fast trains, with healthy food, with more respect for nature, for the soil, for bees, for animals. I would like to leave to my young daughter, who is four today, such a country and such a continent. And young people, and this is very important, do not want to live in a country in which the extreme right is governing. This is why I ask you, President, do not allow Romania to have a fascist government. We did not need a new referendum of hate. Europe l leaves, loves the human rights and the human right to love whoever you wish to. And Romania must ensure that it will not allow the agents of Russia to uh, create policy for Romanians. Emil Cioran said, the past of Romania is not flattering. I am not proud of the fact that my ancestors have slept for so long waiting for freedom. Today we are free. We do not wait for freedom, but we will not give in to extremists. We have what we need. We have resources. We have our heart. Our heart beats for Romania and for Europe. Thank you. On behalf of the ECR group to Christian Terhes. Madam President, Madam Commissioner, Mr. President, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, this is Europe debates held in the European Parliament are a great opportunity for European political leaders to express their vision about the current and future course of Europe. I congratulate, therefore, the Romanian President Klaus Johannes for sharing his vision about Europe and emphasizing the importance of Romania for the European project. But since the emphasizing the importance of Romania, for the European project. But since the debate is about Europe, before we talk about what Europe is, it is imperative to look back and see what Europe was, how this project started, where it is heading, and if this new direction has anything in common with the initial project. When Madame von der Leyen held her speech in this plenary in 2019, she said that the European project is based on, I quote, on the Romanian law, on the Roman law, and the Greek philosophy, end quote. She forgot one, and the most important pillar of the European project, the Judeo-Christian values, civilization, and culture. It was the Christian belief and the Judeo-Christian values based on the Bible that gave the power and the motivation to many political leaders from different European nations, which killed, destroyed, and decimated each other during the Second World War, to meet after the war, pray together, forgive and reconcile with each other, and come up with an economical and political, or political plan that would and brought peace through prosperity. Because of these visionary, faithful, and courageous political leaders, the Western Europe was able to achieve peace and hold it for over 80 years, which was unprecedented for Europe. I say Western Europe because us in the Eastern Europe, we were under the Soviet occupation and we experienced a different kind of political and economical system, an atheistic one, which the state and where the state and the Communist Party was God, where the state was above all and people were deprived of their basic fundamental rights. The difference between the two political and economical systems that Europe experienced after the Second World War the European project that we witness here, which evolved in the European Community and Union in Western Europe, and the USSR and the Soviet Marxist and Communist model in Eastern Europe, it's exactly the pillar that was, intentionally or not, forgotten by Madame Ursula von der Leyen, the Judeo-Christian values, culture, and civilization. The Judeo-Christian values are the source of and notions that later evolved and were mentioned in international treaty national constitutions and laws like human dignity, equality before the law, separation of powers in the state, or inalienable fundamental human rights. Robert Schuman, a founding father of the European project and former president of the European Parliament said, and I quote, democracy owns its existence to Christianity. Christianity teaches equality of all nature, of all men, children of the same God, redeemed by the same Christ, 
without discrimination of race, color, class, or profession. Democracy will be Christian or it won't exist. An unchristian democracy is a caricature which sinks into tyranny or anarchy. It was exactly these Judeo-Christian values that brought peace, prosperity, respect among nations in Western Europe, and the lack of them that brought tyranny, abuse, and poverty in the U.S. society in Eastern Europe. It was this faith in God that my fellow Romanians held strong under communism and motivated them to dream and fight for freedom. It is therefore incomprehensible for many fellow Romanians why in the past four years exactly these personal and national freedoms are violated by the European Commission under Ursula von der Leyen. The European project was built on a free market principle which, was brought, which has brought prosperity in Western Europe. In the past four years under the current European Commission, we see that free market principles are becoming an over-regulated one, which is making the European businesses and products less likely to be competitive on the global market. The European project was built on the concept that fundamental human rights are inalienable and the governments must not, must not force or impose medical products into citizens' bodies, but allow them to decide based on their free and informed consent. We saw what happened during the pandemic when people were forced to be vaccinated with medical products that we find out now later on have many adverse effects. Europe has long been a reference of democracy and human rights, championing principles of liberty, equality and rule of law. Any erosion of these fundamental rights, even by EU entities, represents a betrayal of our shared values and must be met with firm opposition. The Romanian nation, which I most proudly represent, Thank you. was able to overcome any challenges during history and become today one of the fastest growing economies in Europe. Terhes. We did it through Thank faith you. and fight Thank for you. freedom. Thank, Thank you. Next, ID Group, Gunnar Beck. Two and a half minutes. Thank you, President, Commissioner, Your Excellency. Romania's motor insurance industry has been in turmoil in recent years. Twelve companies providing motor insurance have been driven out of business in just 12 years. Twelve insurance fails in 12 years should raise serious concerns about the regulatory environment in the member state. In 2019, the Romanian insurance regulator, ASF, asked Euroins Romania to buy the then failing city insurance. Just three years later, ASF suspended Euroins's insurance license in Romania, apparently for questionable reasons. This was Romania's last motor insurer, gone. Last year, the European Bank of Reconstruction and Development raised questions with the Romanian finance minister about the actions of ASF and submitted a resolution proposal to your predecessor to no effect. The European insurance watchdog, IOPA, wrote a report about the Euroins affair. In a reply to my written question, the European Commission claims it never saw the report. To date, I'm denied access to the full details of the IOPA report. What are ASF and IOPA trying to hide from the European Commission and members of the European Parliament? One observation, following the decision to strip Euroins of its license, ASF awarded a license to Aizi Azi Gurari, a subsidiary of Superbet. And who is the chairman of Superbet? One of Commission President Ursula von der Leyen's brothers. Your Excellency, Romania is one of the largest net recipients of EU money. You are receiving 10 billion euros from the European budget and the next generation EU fund. According to the Corruption Perception Index of Transparency International, you're the second most corrupt country in the European Union. Now, none of this is ideal for a country hoping to attract foreign investors. What I'm asking, are you proposing to do about it? Thank you. I give the floor now to Claire Daly on behalf of the left group. 
Thank you, President and President. I listen very carefully to your opening remarks. And for me, I think Romania is one of the most interesting European countries. I think the Romanian people are pretty much like the Irish people in my experience in terms of their approach to life. And I spent a month in Timisoara and Bucharest in the spring of 1990 as a student leader from Ireland and learned so much about the hopes and aspirations of Romanian citizens in the post Ceausescu years. And I think against that backdrop, for me, it's quite unfortunate to see that since joining the EU, so many Romanian people have been forced to leave the country or been hoovered up by Western Europe as a sort of pool of cheap labour rather than having the opportunities that they should have had at home. I'm sorry to see that you ended up joining NATO and that you're spending so much of your defence money uh, on things that really should be spent on making people's lives better. And I am sorry to see cases such as the one highlighted by my colleague about the very, very serious problems and questions that remain to be answered regarding the operation of the Romanian regulator, the ASF, because of the consequential impact, not just on your own uh, drivers, but also across the EU motor insurance sector. And I, too, am one of the members of this House who for many months now have been raising questions about that regulator's decision to withdraw the license to Euroins Romania, which is obviously part of the largest independent insurance group in Central Eastern and South Eastern Europe. Now, I know you know about that case, Mr. President, and not just because my colleague raised it, but it is beyond curious that the Romanian regulator acted against this company three years after requesting them to take over city insurance. Why did they do this? It is a fact that both the Bulgarian financial regulator and the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development queried what your regulator was up to. Both of them approached the European authorities. One of the organisations produced a report cautioning against the consequences of this. They even produced a resolution proposal which would have mitigated the impacts, but nothing happened. And your country faces exposure to a 500 million euro lawsuit, uh, not to mention the broader impact beyond. So I suppose Having brought this to the attention of the European Insurance and Occupation Pensions Authority, who are supposed to mitigate these um, issues, but who have failed to produce the report for members of this parliament, it's being withheld from us, I'm deeply concerned about the security around this case. So I suppose my question, Mr. President, is really quite a simple one. In the interests of the citizens of Romania, and beyond, would you join us in supporting our call to the European Commission to initiate a comprehensive and independent review of this case? I give the floor now to Johan Rares Bogdan, one and a half minutes. Dear Roberta, Domnule Președinte, Excellency. Mr. President, and Madam President, Your Excellency, Your Excellencies, I have had the privilege to listen to the analysis and the vision of a real statesman. Klaus Johannes, the president of Romania of the last nine years, voted twi twice in office uh, by over uh, seven million uh, Romanians. This man has a, a, a vocation for the European construction. It's not just a speech. This is Romania, dear colleagues, the most important country to secure to, to give us security on the Black Sea. Uh, we have a, a huge uh, border with Ukraine. Over 7 million uh, Ukrainians uh, have taken shelter in Romania, fleeing war over the past two years. And, and uh, Romanians never uh, closed their borders, were never hostile towards those who were trying to save their lives and the lives of their children. On the contrary, on an institutional level, led by President Johannes, and on a personal level, each and every person opened their hearts and opened their homes to refugees. We are not the richest in Europe. Europe. We're not the ones that receive the most help, but we uh, are the most hospitable, perhaps. And this is Romania. This is Romania, an honest country. We, um, uh, have, uh, we are under attack uh, by uh, this uh, um, uh, Russian dictatorship who hates democracy. We're, we are um, under cyber attack, and uh, he's trying to corrupt voters and to destabilize uh, Romania and its European path. He's trying uh, to... Uh, 
uh, to destroy our values, but Romanians will stay European. President Johannes will uh, fight until the last day of his uh, term in office to make sure that things uh, um, remain the way they are. We have a huge uh, en uh, energy potential, and the uh, investment and the investment in this country will uh, make the, uh, Europe's uh, energy efficiency hang in the uh, balance. And we are a rational state, pro uh, profoundly pro-European. And I would like other countries to follow uh, our lead. We have uh, a president that managed to, uh, to promote the, uh, his country's interest without uh, jeopardizing uh, the interests of the region um, and, the, and in Romania. There's a song that was sung first 150 years ago, uh, and this, in this song, Hora Unir, it says, uh, if the one person is alone, uh, we are alone, but if we have two people, then we're uh, united. And in these uh, hard times, uh, this could be our motto. This could be the, the um, uh, anthem of Europe right now, Hora Unir. Maria Grablini next. Uh, one minute. <laughs> one minute, one minute. It will start. Doamna președintă, dragă President de Roberta, President, Minister, first of all, I want to thank you for describing my country in such a beautiful manner, and it is true. And dear colleagues, the ones who tried to defamate Romania, I want you to try to understand it, to visit it and talk to Romanians, and then you will understand. I want to be objective. I want to speak about the issues that we have raised in front of all uh, heads of state. I want to ask you, do you really like the way Europe looks, what Europe, Europe looks like right now? Do you think we could have done more? Do we really have social cohesion? Um, I am in the um, IMCO committee and I refuse to say single market, which you have said, just as uh, Commissioner Breton, because I believe we do not have a single market yet and this is what we must fight for. I am finishing my second mandate and I am quite disappointed because we do not have a single market and Romania is not in the Schengen area. And then, do you think it is fair that the CAP, is the CAP fair? Why do we not have fairness for such a long time? We have so many farmers in Europe who are protesting. Why are they not rewarded in the same manner throughout Europe? I think these are problems that could have been solved. And in these years. And even, even as we finish our mandates, we must continue our efforts because we know in the Council, is, the Council is where decisions are taken. I thank you and I congratulate you. Two minutes. Mr. President, uh, election year 2024 is crucial for Europe because the values on which uh, it was built and have worked so far are under siege from extremism, anti-European feelings and disinformation. This is why in order to keep democracy alive, this year's debates need to be relevant for citizens' daily lives and not so much so for the survival of political parties of some political leaders. For Romania, the challenge is even greater. We have all of our elections uh, this year happening this year. This can lead to a um, complete reset of the political establishment in Romania. And uh, although we have uh, uh, made uh, slow steps on the European um, uh, path, Romania uh, is now uh, a, an eastern pillar of the Europe, and thanks to uh, our society. And Mr. President, you are the last political actor to step out uh, after the elections this year without uh, anything at stake until then. You have a duty to uh, communicate to our citizens how important it is for us to belong to the European family. This is a complicated year with uh, a lot of um, populist challenges, and I think you can do this in a credible way and clear way. Romania and the European Union cannot slip uh, into extremism without solutions. Uh, and all this uh, election um, pressure um, makes us uh, wonder what kind of leader our citizens, our Romanian citizens and European citizens expect today. Because after many disappointments, Rom the Romanians um, feel that the leaders are disconnected for, from them. They don't uh, talk to them in simple, clear ways, even when they do talk to them. And the effort to build bridges again in our uh, crisis-hit uh, society uh, is going to be huge. And 
but what is at stake here for us and for the union is also huge, the farmers, uh, youth without uh, a future. Um, citizens that have been forgotten in small uh, uh, towns uh, need to find their motivation again and to be uh, committed for uh, uh, with a vision for the future where Brussels and Strasbourg are on their side and not their enemies uh, in their imagination. Grunenberg, one minute. This is Europe. This is Europa. This is Europe. Yes, yes. Well, we have no choice other than to work together for climate st stability and biodiversity, dear colleagues. And we need Romania and its uh, treasury of, or veritable treasure chest of um, a primeval forest. So thank you very much, President, for protecting these forests. I myself have been to the Fakash Mountains and other beautiful places in Romania, and uh, I've seen the beauty of your unique forests. And uh, there are so many endemic uh, a species of flora and fauna that I've seen, but I've also seen progressive uh, cutting down of forests, the clearing of woods and forests in Natura 2000 areas, and uh, degradation of soil and erosion of uh, soil because there are no roots holding it together. We know that uh, um, a procedure has been uh, initiated against Romanian. There were promises of um, mitigating measures. But this uh, issue of tree felling is not on the agenda. So, President Johannes, uh, how are you making progress uh, when it comes to reform of the forestry sector, uh, putting an end to uh, clear felling, uh, training uh, young people to work in the forest? We need your help. Anna Bonfrisco, two minutes. Thank you, Chair. Signora Commissaria. Madam Commissioner. President Johannes, sir, in March, you will guide Romania into Schengen. It's a historic moment, and it will make your country and the European Union stronger. And I would like to state that Italy and Romania will also be strengthening their historic historic, economic, social, economic, and cultural links that are based on the Judeo-Christian values. There are more than a million Romanians living in Italy, and 19,000 uh, Italian companies exist in Romania. We are growing together. We are also linked via NATO, Sigardian, in the defense of the Mediterranean. And in Schengen, it, it gives strength to our uh, union in political and judicial cooperation in fighting criminal organizations, giving security to the EU and our allies, as Romania very generously welcomed Ukrainian refugees. I'd also like to welcome this possibility to speak to you, sir, to draw attention to perhaps a minor issue, but linked to the illegal trafficking of animals and mistreatment. One of the major funding sources for international cr criminal organizations. We must fight together within our history and our friendship that we have seen and to have the most uh, authentic uh, demonstration of Europe via fighting this. Thank you. President, uh, Mr. President, Madam Commissioner, Hertha Müller once wrote, in this country, we had to walk, eat, sleep, and love in fear. When we read about life in communist times, we can only appreciate Romanian success in the European project. Actually, Romanian culture and heritage is indispensable for Europe because it merges the Roman Latin culture with the Orthodox heritage and with Germanic, Slavian and Magyar influence. And that gives Romanians a unique ability to understand European diversity. We have seen Romanians' amazing economic development under your presidency and impressive progress in the rule of law. Today, 
when we see attacks on the rule of law in Spain, in Malta, in Slovakia, we have to congratulate you, Mr. President, for your exemplary leadership. And we have an historic step in the lifting of air and sea border controls. But that is not enough. Romania, Romania like Bulgaria, must fully join Schengen. You dealt with the migration crisis, pandemic restrictions, and the arrival of war refugees in an extraordinary manner under immense pressure. The EPP has always been on your side in this matter. As the great Romanian poet, Mihai Eminescu, once wrote, Vreme treshe, vreme vine. Time goes by, time comes along. The time Thank for you. complete and full accession to Schengen has come. Vreme treshe, vreme vine. Thank you, Mr. Rangel. Next, Vice President Angel, one minute. President Johannes, it's an honor, great honor to have you here in the House of European Democracy here. And of course, we welcome the Romanian citizens soon in the Schengen area so that they can cross borders of, on sea and land without any controls. We're very disappointed in the Socialists and Democrats that these land borders are uh, may be disappearing, but there are still problems with the environment. There's a lot of destruction of the environment and also a lot of goods that are meant to be going to and from uh, Ukraine have remained blocked. And so we insist that the borders be opened up. We insist that Council does something about this because Romania deserves this uh, roundly. We want to continue to strengthen our European project by doing this. President, we're facing huge challenges. The digitization of our societies, for example, and briefly, uh, recently I had an opportunity to attend an event organized by Mr. Negrescu, our colleague, on digital competence in the rural areas. And at this conference I heard about a lot of very interesting um, experiences and projects in Romania. I'd like to see how you see the challenge of digital transformation in Europe and what sort of ideas you can give us to succeed. Should we continue to regulate or should we leave this up to the techno giants and algorithms? Julius Botos, two minutes. Thank you, Madam President Metzola, dear Madam Commissioner, Madam Minister, Mr. President, uh, I am honored uh, that the President of Romania uh, is giving a speech before the European Parliament in Strasbourg. Romania, and neighbors, uh, Ukraine and the Republic of Moldova, where Russia keeps uh, trying to exert its influence. Uh, we are a Black Sea uh, country where the um, war is affecting all the countries in the area. This is why it's paramount that Romania stay a democracy built on European values. This is Europe. This is a topic at hand, and Romania is part of the EU, has been part of the EU for 17 years. And we see uh, how Romania is developing, is becoming more modern, and the 90 billion uh, euros from European funding have helped this tremendously, but also the fact that Romanian citizens uh, uh, have access to the European culture and life, even though we're not still fully, uh, fully fledged members of Schengen, and we need to step on it here, and I'm very glad that you have said it in no uncertain terms here in the plenary. Romania has shown that it has uh, the European values in its DNA and that it's promoting these values, even when Romanian politicians have taken wrong, have made wrong decisions. The citizens uh, have been staunch protectors of, the, of democracy and the rule of law and uh, uh, European values. Romania is the rule of law and this uh, is very important for the lives of each and every uh, citizen. We all have a set of rules and no one, no matter how uh, high uh, the, the position uh, is above these rules. And speaking of rules, 
uh, rules are the rules even in an uh, election year. And the trust that uh, EU citizens have in, EU, in the EU institutions will grow if we manage to talk to our citizens in an open way and explain to them step by step not only what they can do for Europe, but what, the, what Europe is doing for them on a daily basis. And we won't be able to do this uh, if uh, the d debate in Europe, uh, in, in Romania, is going to be skewed. One minute. Thank you, President, and thank you, President Johannes, for sharing your perspectives on our common European future. Very often this House is used for national debates, even from prime ministers and presidents, so I'm very thankful that you shared your vision for what Europe should look like. So let me ask you quite concretely, when do you think can we have an improved decision-making in the Council? When will we move to qualified majority? When can we actually change the treaties? I would love to hear an answer on that. And then second, we have a great moment of European democracy coming up uh, with the European elections. But looking at the different countries and also at Romania, I do see inhibiting factors to democracy, such as the amount of signatures you need to collect to be able to run as a party, such as the fact that you can, I think, only be, or you have to be 23 to be able to be a candidate. These are all things that could potentially slow down our democratic participation. So maybe a last question on this. Will you advance the European Electoral Law Act that we proposed here in 2020 with a second vote for transnationalists to strengthen our European democracy? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Berzelager. Next, Sven Simon, one minute. Frau Präsidentin. Madam President, President Johannes, you are a president who in his own country has always pushed for reforms. You stand by the rule of law. Your fight against corruption is exemplary. And it is a great deal up to you that Romania will be part of the Schengen Agreement. This strength of reforms, ladies and gentlemen, is something that we now need at European level. The European Union was founded to protect Europeans from each other. And now we need to further develop it to protect Europeans against the rest of the world. The European Parliament has pushed for proposals for reform to make the European Union more able to act in the future. The Council is having difficulties coming up with an answer to reach a decision on a convention. You, President, mentioned that there's a lot that we could change without changing the treaties. But if we really want to overcome the internal opposition and improve our action outside the European Union, we need a European Convention, and I'd call for your support for the convention of that convention. One minute. Thank you. In order to s tackle global challenges, we must first tackle our own challenges at home. We are faced with global crises and challenges, but we seem to have forgotten the people who are next to us. We have lost the contact with those who we, we represent here. The dissatisfaction of Romanians is growing, and it is related to daily life. We see the protests of farmers and people in the transport sector, but the truth is that we are all affected by the crisis. President, we could have done more for Romanians. Honourable Commission, Honourable Council, you have often ignored the problems of my people. And I have seen too many colleagues who were not able to say no when our interests were, were thrashed. I am going to repeat what I have always said. I believe we must reconnect to the problems of ordinary people in our own countries, in our own cities. I think this is the only manner that we will be able to increase their confidence that what we do here is for their own good. This is the only way that Yash and Romania will be in good hands, just like the whole of Europe. Thank you. Thank you, President. Every European citizen understands what I've just said in Hungarian, and not uh, 
because uh, the majority is now learning the uh, language of the minority. But in 2020, you used the Hungarian language uh, as a political weapon against your opponents. Ever since you've come uh, to office, you uh, haven't... Uh, answered uh, the plea uh, of the uh, Hungarian minority to have uh, uh, an agreement, to reach an agreement uh, with the minority. And they're, they're, other countries uh, are, are doing it, but there are issues that are taboo in Bucharest. And the extreme right is gaining ground in Romania. Uh, uh, xenophobia and uh, anti-democratic feelings and anti-European feelings uh, are gaining ground, and they... Um, uh, uh, come from the same parents, and there's lots to be done in Romania, st in Romania still, and in, in, in the EU for Romania. We are, are on a path of uh, full integration in the EU. This is why we need to become full members of the Schengen area, because this is a right that we have earned. Minutes. President Ioannis, La Romania. President Johannes, Romania is an important European country. It acceded to the EU in 2007 and in March will enter Schengen. This is excellent news because it means that we have a more united and stronger Europe in which citizens can have the same rights. Europe has many challenges to face together here in this European Parliament. In the course of recent months, we had the first law on AI, the first one in the world. That is not enough. When we look at migration, for example, Europe needs to speak with one voice, no nationalistic vetoes. We must be structural in our approach and not in an emergency approach for those who arrive from the Mediterranean and the Balkans. Digital revolution, climate action, new changes to work, fighting inequality. These are the priorities of our platform. The elections are just around the corner and they are going to be crucial for this continent. Millions of young Europeans are asking for a better future. We must be able to make sure that happens by making the best possible choices. Thank you. Sean, one and a half minutes. Thank you, Madam President. President Johannes, welcome back to the European Parliament. We very well remember here your speech from 2018 when you stood up for European values and told us that unity and solidarity are the solutions for Europe. Time has proven you right. We have seen that Europe stays united. It provides solutions and helps people in need. We have seen you defending European values and we have seen you defending a European approach to challenges that we are facing. Romania has chosen the pro-European path and we have seen a European decade in Romania under your leadership and for this we say thank you today. We are seeing today that Romania believes in Europe and we are also seeing that Europe believes in Romania. Together we have managed over recent years to create the biggest package of economic support after the pandemic. You always advocated for strong support for Ukraine. You led the efforts of supporting the Republic of Moldova and you helped Europe understand that we are only safe if our neighboring countries are safe. Looking ahead, our common task is to defend Europe. Europe means security, Europe means prosperity, democracy, rule of law, and Europe means stability. As pro-Europeans, we shall continue to provide solutions and tell people that extremism is no solution to any of the difficulties and challenges that we face. As pro-Europeans, we have to speak up to defend Europe and defend European values. This is what we stand for as a clear majority of pro-Europeans here in the European Parliament. This is what we are ready to achieve in the next years together with you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Murashan. Can I please ask the colleagues to be quiet as we finalize this debate with the President of Romania, Klaus Johannes. Dominic Ruiz de Veza, one minute. Muchas gracias. Yes, thank you very much, uh, President Medsola. And thank you also to President Johannes for your words. I would like to congratulate you for your commitment to European integration and for your European spirit. And I would also like to thank you for having mentioned the institutional dimension in your presentation. I think it's only quite clear that if we have an enlarged Europe, and if we do start relaunching the enlargement process in the European Union, we're going to have to make sure that that is accompanied by a deepening of the accompanying processes. You have referred to the fact that we should not rule out 
a reform of the treaties, which is something I welcome as well. But I think we have to go a step further in that direction. You refer to the passerelle clauses. It is true these could be triggered because they are set out in the Lisbon Treaty to allow us to deal with more uh, issues uh, by qualified majority voting. But for the past 14 years, the Council has not managed to do this. And I very much hope that we don't have to wait yet another 14 years. So please support the European Parliament's proposal of reform of the treaties. Minutes. Madam President, Madam Commissioner, Mr. President, Bulgaria and Romania fulfill all the requirements for full Schengen membership. This has been repeatedly confirmed here in this plenary hall. Nevertheless, for political reasons, we are kept outside for more than 10 years, and this makes our citizens a inferior category of uh, Europeans who cannot enjoy the full range of their rights. So a partial uh, access is not a success. Mr. President, what are the specific uh, actions you discuss with uh, Bulgaria to remove all the obstacles in our transport links. The discrimination against Bulgarians and Romanians cannot be tolerated. Dear President, thank you for your presentation today. Our two countries have similar histories, not just in Christian orthodoxy, but we had dictatorships. You had a totalitarian country run by the Kremlin, we had a dictatorship run by the Pentagon. Today, we see clouds gathering over Europe. We have your elections. I would like your wisdom and your experience. How do we convince the voter that the solution is not the extreme populace, but more democracy, that we need a new contract for the citizen of Europe? That's what I would call it, a contract to complete the European project something that most of the members here and the farmers in the streets feel has not been completed. So it's our duty and your wisdom, perhaps, in the answer to help us come up with the proper arguments to bring Europe of our dreams. Thank you. Thank you very much. That brings us to the time for Mr. President to respond to a variety of questions and comments that have been made. Mr. President, you have the floor to conclude this debate. Can I please ask you, dear colleagues, to keep quiet? Thank you, Madam President. Honorable members of the European Parliament, thank you very much. It is a privilege for me to speak to you here in the center of European democracy. Thank you for your very positive feedback. I thank the speakers of the political groups for their positions and uh, I appreciate very much the positive and constructive approach in all the views expressed here. But let me thank you specifically for one issue most of all mentioned which is the Schengen issue. Romania is a very determined, a very strong, and a very faithful member of the Union. We really believe that the Union has to be united, strong, secure, prosperous. To make this happen, we have to finish the European integration of all the member states including Romania. <clears throat> so, let's hope that we make the decisive step. We have the first step in place. It's a good sign. And let's continue. Um, there have been then some issues and um, 
I think you're, you agree it would go too far if I answered each and every question. So let me just point out a relatively small number of issues. And I think you expect me to be honest on these things. So I'll try to be short and honest. When I ran for president in 2014 for the first time, I promised to the Romanians a couple of things. I, I'm not a, not a great speaker, and I, I'm not excelling in promises. So I said, I will keep Romania firm on the European track, on the transatlantic track. I will see about the economy as far as the president can do this to bring more prosperity. But one important issue, which was very dear to me, I promised to strengthen the rule of law, which I did. We have less corruption. We have an independent judiciary. And this is not what I say, it's what the Commission says and what you said because you accepted the Commission's report on the so-called CVM. And one important issue was not only to have an independent judiciary, a strong prosecution, it was also important to have independent regulators. Well, I hear that one regulator had an issue with one business, and as everywhere in a democracy and the rule of law, people, if they feel the decision was not so good, go before a judge. This is what happened. And the judges decided that the decision was correct. This is what I understand if we speak about the rule of law. Everybody has the same right. Everybody has the right to a fair trial. And everybody has to accept the result. Now, many of you asked more or less precisely what I believe should happen in the European Union. I stated a number of issues in my uh, opening remarks, but if it comes to it, what, what should we do with the Union to make it function better? Where, where, where are the problems? Where are the real problems? Where are the systemic problems? And what can be done? Well, some systemic problems and some important issues have been discussed in this house, on our streets, in the marketplaces, and in convenings. This is, I think you just finished before I arrived, uh, a discussion about the common European agricultural policy. That's an issue. We have a decision on this as of 2020, four years ago. So obviously people ask me and I ask others, why did it take us four years and huge European protests to rethink some issues of the common agricultural policy? Maybe it could have happened faster. We are talking about the environment, about climate change. That's all correct. Personally, I'm very much involved in these issues. I am really convinced that we have to find clim fight climate change. And I believe that we have to protect our environment. And we can do it. We proved it. We proved it in Romania. And we have a good policy in this respect. But we have to do more. Now we have the Green Deal, which is super. But let me tell you, if it is not sustainable, and if it does not lead to economic growth, 
And if we do not take everybody with us, it will be a failure. So, brief elections upcoming. Most of you are probably running for new mandate. That's fine. Not me. I'm finished. End of this year, I finish my mandate, and that's it. So, I believe that three things should be changed or should be improved. First, our relationship with the European citizens. My impression, maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm wrong, is that if the citizens are here, we are here. We are levitating a bit high. Maybe we should decrease and be closer to our citizens. Because what we do is correct, but we lost almost lost our ability to explain this to our people. We are not really performing well when it comes to communicate our very good results. We're doing a super job, and more and more Europeans believe the Union is failing. Well, this is about communication. Communication between the voters and the politicians. So this is one issue where I believe we can and should do more and better. Second, some of you asked about decision making. It's about the architecture of the Union. How do we make it better? And we have to improve it. Because if we take in Ukraine, Moldova and the Western Balkans, we will be a large union, and this decision-making, especially in crisis, war, pandemic, and energy crisis, has to be correct, transparent, but fast. So, I believe that we have to work on our architecture. Some of it may be possible to change without opening the treaties, but some issues have to be changed in the treaties. They are not perfect since we have these treaties. I hope you don't mind me telling you years have passed. We are a different union and we work towards a different union and I hope very much you agree we work towards a better union. So let's work on this. At least one issue, and you will know what I mentioned. It is not acceptable that one member is using a veto to stop all of us helping others. So if we're not in a position yet to generalize a qualified majority of voting, which may be defined different than it is now, not talking about the details, but at least we should have the courage to say no veto and let's take it out of the decision-making process. That's something very concrete we should do. Finally, our external image. Well, I believe we have to be much better here. First, we have to integrate those who want to be with us and those we want to be with us, Ukraine, Moldova, Western Balkans, they try to become parts of, part of the, the Union, some of them, for 20 years. I mean, are we serious? Are we? Do we want them? If we do, let's go. If not, let's say them, no. But dragging on, you know very well, never makes things better. And <laughs> somehow linked to this is how we act towards others. It's what we call foreign policy. Well, guess what? We don't have one. This is strange, isn't it? 
we have as many foreign policies as we have member states. And maybe even more. Thanks, you're right. Maybe this is the reason why our foreign policy weight is way, way, way smaller than our economic weight. And this is not good for us because economic policy and foreign policy have to go hand in hand. So we should work on these two, extension and foreign policy. Now, the elections are upcoming. Each of you is going to, f to fight for a seat or a principle or a value. That's correct. Every party comes up with concepts, with ideas, with policies. You will accuse each other of being, well, the wrong guys. You will fight for as many votes as possible. That's absolutely fair. That's the essence of democracy. Campaigning, profiling, trying to be the best. Please do so. You sitting here are the best. This is why you sit here. But please, if you fight each other, don't fight Europe. If you fight... If you fight for votes against your opponents, still fight for European Union. And if you fight with the other party and tell them they are not the right guys, please do not fight against the European solidarity. Because without this, we are doomed. So no matter who is winning, and I hope the best are winning. Let's uphold our values, our principles, our unity, and our solidarity. Thank you very much.